Wednesday, and we are here with this week's episode of Whiteboard Wednesday. So if you're keeping track of all this stuff, today's August 17th of 2022, but if you're actually finding this on YouTube later, well, then it's not, right? So anyway, uh, today, what I, <coughs> excuse me, what I want to focus on is handgun defense, and I have it listed as handgun defense one, because we're talking, we're, we're, we're going to look at some phases here, right? But before I mention that, or before I jump into this, right, um, interesting, right? I got another one of these little comments uh, online, uh, didn't come by way of email this time, right? Someone had posted that it's a pity that uh, my dojo doesn't teach traditional ninjutsu, um, whatever. I, I tend to leave those kind of things alone because I have enough students that train with me that can do what they do, right? Um, but let me show you something, okay? <clears throat> Recognize this guy? Maybe not anymore because he doesn't have purple hair, right? But uh, let me see if I can even find a published date on this thing. Wow, way back when the books were like 12 bucks. Um, these are written backwards. Shit, sorry. Uh, let's see. Backwards for Western people. I, I, I don't see one. Uh, I believe this came out in the mid to late 80s. Uh, I take that back. Yeah, give or take, late 80s, no later than the early 90s, right? Uh, what ended up happening was Hatsumi Sensei had uh, been uh, hosted, right, brought here uh, to the United States to do uh, a seminar, right? Uh, one of these Taikai, I don't even know if we called them Taikai back then, right? Um, but when he came back, a lot of the Western teachers... Uh, during their breakout sessions, when they were teaching things, they were covering things like knife defense, gun defense, those kind of things, right? And so um, in typical ninja style, Hatsumi Sensei took notebooks full of notes, a ton of notes, okay, where he was learning from his students, right? Because what was happening was the principles and concepts from the traditional models and all that were being applied to things that not a big deal in Japan, Right. Especially guns. Right. They're absolutely illegal. That doesn't mean that the Yakuza and other uh, gangsters and whatnot don't have them. But it's not a typical thing for uh, everybody living there. Right. So, again, he took tons and tons of notes, went back to Japan, spent some time with his close students working out some things. Right. And wrote a damn book. OK. All based on the the impetus was what his own uh, Western students, right, were doing to translate this art into a common modern uh, Western problem. And this is not, I don't, I'm not going to get into a debate or a pissing contest with anybody who uh, thinks that, you know, there should be gun control or not, you know, whatever, right? Uh, you know, if you're in, in these different countries where you have those things or, you know, there's Uber limitations or whatever, I'm not getting into a pissing contest, right? It's a tool, it exists, right? Criminals and bad guys will always get them, whatever, okay? So, and this is not about me liking them, disliking them, or whatever. I have a very neutral perspective on them, um, but it's kind of like motorcycles, right? I know, how to drive, I know how to ride one, right? Even though I don't have one, and that's not my preferred mode of transportation, right? I wouldn't consider myself to be a biker by any means, right? And I don't get my jollies by jumping on a two-wheel machine. I have students that are that way, and that's great, right? But... It's about where things are, right? So again, techniques upon techniques upon techniques. So perhaps this student or somebody else would like to write to Hatsumi Sensei, who's now sporting a wheelchair, right? But maybe they'd like to write to him and say, um, this is bullshit, right? Because this is not traditional, right? Maybe, okay? And it's simply titled Knife and Pistol Fighting. If you can find this in a used bookstore, uh, there might have been one that came out with like an English language translation, but there's translation services all over the place. Or maybe to be a good impetus, like it was for me, to go ahead and start to learn how to uh, read, write, and speak a language. Okay. But anyway, so I wanted to kick this off. Uh, and I also want to discuss that a lot of the things that we do, right, while it has a modern context to it, right, it's all based on classical traditional things like. Uh, what we're going to be talking about today, uh, keeping somebody from getting to their getting at their weapon, right? This is all firmly based in traditional things, right? Kumuch, right? This this neutral setup kind of thing uh, uh, that's uh, was uh, fighting in armor kind of things, right? Now it's not limited to this, but what most people see as a as a conventional or a, as a simple judo setup, right, is actually based on sword and other weapon work, 
Okay. And it's about preventing the other person, just like he's trying to prevent you from getting at their weapons. Okay. And what you're starting with is a state position. Okay. So if people don't understand that and they're just looking beyond it, you know, this is just, this is how our style sets things up. Well, then they're, then they're instilled in their toddler clothes and diapers as far as the art's concerned. And I'm not having a conversation about whether something's traditional or not or whatever with somebody like that. Okay. So anyway, as a matter of fact, this, this fall camp that's coming up for us, September 30th through October 1st and 2nd. So if you're watching this later than that, maybe there'll be a link in the description if you're on YouTube uh, to get the, the recordings for it or whatever. I don't know at this point, but what we're going to be doing is translating the initial, the, the traditional, the traditional, right? And I, I love that word. No, I don't, right? Because people like to say traditional, assuming that, like, you know, it's all this stuff from a certain era or, you know, all up to a certain point, right? Because they've got this fantasy shit going on in their head, right? But in some cases in our art, tradition goes back to Takamatsu Sensei, and that's where it started, okay? Right? Maybe it went to one of his three teachers. Maybe Hatsumi Sensei, when he restructured um, or or added his input, right, to the Tenshi Jin Uriaka no Maki from the Gyoko school, right? So people throw shit around. They throw words around because somehow it, it plays into some kind of fantasy. But what it really does is it, it comes from and it, and it highlights a belief that they have, a character trait that they have, or... A, a kind of a, a habit pattern that they have that actually creates a stop gap. And then that in and of itself, it was supposed to be an expedient to get them to a certain point of understanding, but now they won't let go of it. And now it's preventing them from getting much better uh, training skill sets or whatever. Anyway. All right. So that being said, uh, a lot of this stuff is also based on my actual experience as a federal police officer, as a military policeman in the United States army military police corps. And, having to have this at a bare minimum as a consideration and in other contexts, not dying. Okay. So uh, some of you guys may already know the story that I was arresting somebody one time. And um, again, 70, 80% of the people that I ever arrested when I was a military policeman, right. Um, if you think about this, they were trained killers. Okay. And one time I was, I was apprehending somebody. That was the word we used in the military police, not arrest. It was apprehend. Right. But he went for my weapon, got my weapon out, and tried to shoot me in the head with it. And Tajitsu and some extra little survival traits and oh shit moments later, right? I'm talking about it. He's at Fort Leavenworth. Um, I don't know, maybe still there, whatever. Anyway, all right. So um, let me find a cool marker, right? I already drew things up here for you. You guys already know that, uh, you know, my handwriting is crap. And so mm, drawing skills, what do you think? Maybe a little bit better, right? Sensei he has no feet. Yeah, whatever, right? This is this is like, you know, hip-hop dude uh, walking on his shoes and stuff because his pants, maybe I should have put his like, um, uh, waistline like way farther down or whatever, okay? But I'll add some things to, uh, to this as we go along. But what I want to start off with are three phases. Like when we're talking about handgun defense, right? So again, not talking about long arm, uh, shotgun, rifle, anything like that, right? We're talking about handgun, something smaller, right? Um, that, you know, fits in the same kind of category as, as shoot again or knife or whatever. Operates differently. And some other time we'll talk about advantages and disadvantages and all that. Doesn't matter at this point, right? What matters is that this is a part of the Muto Dori training. Okay. Muto Dori, Muto Dori uh, literally translates as no blade catch or no blade seize. The, the implication is we're unarmed, he's armed, or we might be armed just like he is, but his weapon's out. And in the time it's going to take me to, to get to mine, I'm going to die. Okay. So uh, Hatsumi Sensei has taught for years, right? It's in written print. It's in videos. It's, it happened in live training and all that, right? That Muto Dori is not limited to the blade aspect, right? It's unarmed against weapons. Okay. So uh, the, the idea here is he has it and either I don't or mine's not out yet, right? So we want to make sure that we're, we're putting this in the right place. Muto Dori training is in the upper levels, Okuden, right? Uh, higher level uh, training, right? This is also a category of like, what if, okay? Um, so anyway, there are three phases, right? 
three phases that fit into this unarmed defense uh, kind of thing, all right? So again, um, did my little drawing things here, right? So, uh, and again, I'm just arbitrarily throwing these things out. You can put whatever numbers to them you want, right? So phase one, if you can translate my drawing here, what I have is a holster, right, with the gun in it, okay? So phase one, right, is potential, okay? So potential threat. Okay. He has one, I don't. So sloppy handwriting, right? Anyway, right? Potential threat. Phase two, uh, this is actually a gun pointed directly at me. Okay. See the muzzle, sight, that's the trigger guard. Okay. Anyway, right? So now it's out. It's in my face, right? So now what we have is an active threat. It's an active threat. Okay? It's an act threat. It's out, but it hasn't gone off. And the reality when it comes to handgun defense, right, or this muto dori idea is if somebody draws a weapon on you, I don't care, knife, stick, whatever, right, and they're in threatening mode, okay, you have a chance, okay, you have a chance, okay, because if this guy wanted you dead, no negotiations, no issues or whatever, they just pull it, bang, it's a done deal. Um, so you have... So there's a whole psychology that goes with this, right? Um, most people like to hang out in this area when they're looking at gun defense and things like that. And in all honesty, when I and a lot of my peers who have been in situations like that and have that kind of training, right? Not in the dojo, right? It's kind of like we don't have cross punches in, in Nimpo Taijutsu. Really? Okay. So, sorry, you missed that lesson. Anyway, um, we understand that at this level, right, things are 90% psychology, 10% technique, but most of the techniques that we see being done by people, um, uh, I'm trying to be nice. They're fucked up. Okay. So they're going to get somebody killed. All right. Anyway. All right. So level one or phase one, right, whatever. It's, there's a potential threat because he has it. That means that in our taijutsu training, on our taijutsu, taijutsu training, right? At a certain point, we need to go from just doing tech to free response, obviously, right? We need to go from just controlling him and how well he can get at me to recognizing that anybody I'm facing, unless he's naked or running around at a speedo, right? Could be carrying this or some other kind of weapon that at some point in the engagement, it could come out, okay? So maybe he jumped on me because, who knows, he forgot he had it or he didn't take me very seriously, right? I'm just the old, this old fat bald guy, right? So he jumps and, you know, I hit him a good solid, right? And he staggered back and realizes, shit, right? Now, right, things change, okay? So at a certain point in our Taijutsu training, we have to be adding things in and making sure that we're working with the consideration that this may be happening. This may be in there, right? So during today's training, what I'm going to do is take a look at knowing ahead of time where 90% of attackers who might be armed are carrying, okay? Because we know that, then we can start to work with that, right? Okay. And we'll back up away from that a little bit too, right? And, and talk about a certain type of technique that is across uh, several of the lineages, right? Has a very, very common name. It's just used in Japan and Japanese all the time, right? So when people like like to, you know, grab these names and go, oh, the name of this technique like this, and this is what it means. Yeah, well, it, people say that all the time, every day, because that's what it means, right? So anyway, so there's this potential, Right. And then there's this active threat with them getting it out, right? So what we're going to be doing today and what we're going to take a look at during our Friday virtual class, right? There's the link to that. Um, it's still being updated. So if you're live, uh, you're going to need to give us a little bit of time, maybe, I don't know, 30 minutes after this thing is over to make sure that everything is active. So if you're going to get on that, you can do that. Um, but what we're going to be taking a look at is here to the bridge between these two, right? What we're trying to do with our techniques tactics is to keep him from going from one to from phase one to phase two where it's out and in my face okay because this is a whole different threat 
Okay. This is where, where this is, uh, you know, maybe 20, 30% psychology and mostly technique. This is 90% psychology and 10% technique. Because if you screw this up, he's going to shoot you in the face or wherever. Okay. Um, we need to understand, you know, movement and, and all the, oh, just all kinds of shit. Right. Okay. So phase two, active threats in your face. Phase three, uh, I just have an explosion here because shit's flying, right? Bullets are flying. Okay. Um, and some of you uh, have prior military experience, your vets. Uh, some people may have bumped into it along the way. Uh, or you might have heard me say it because I've been referencing it here lately because camp is coming up. But I've been talking about Murphy's Law of Combat, okay, or Murphy's Laws of Combat, because often people only know of one, right? And that's if the enemy's in range, so am I, right? But there's actually 10 of these, right? Murphy's Laws of Combat. And one of those laws is incoming fire has the right of way, okay? So each one of these things, while they're all under the, under the uh, flag or banner or classification of handgun defense, where are we, right? What's going on? Right? If we can deal with it here, we don't have to worry about these. If we miss this opportunity, we hope to God we end up here because he hasn't pulled the trigger. He's in my face. He's threatening, right? And, and he's trying to get compliance or whatever. He may or may not shoot me after he gets what he wants, right? But I have an opportunity here. It's a whole different world, right? We've already missed all of these things, and now uh, – we're, and if we're in a muto dori situation, right, you can see how the threat just and the danger just escalates beyond what most people ever want to think about, which is why a lot of my friends who are in this art uh, or in any martial art just want guns to go away, right? Because if, if we make them go away, see, then I only have to think about my kajutsu. I only have to think about my unarmed stuff, right? I don't have to worry about this stuff. Well, that would be wonderful, except that... Now we have the technology where people can print a gun with a printer. Uh, they can make, you know, and they've been doing this stuff since, what, the 20s and 30s. Started out the CIA and the spy game and all that, little one-shot kind of things. Whatever, right? Human beings will always find ways to kill or maim or whatever other human beings, okay? And Hatsumi Sensei said this. Look up Hatsumi quotes, right, if you don't believe me, or do some reading other than just, you know, looking at the pictures and then doing the moves, Okay. Hatsumi Sensei's always talked about, uh, you know, what this is designed for is learning how to kill efficiency, efficiently and whatnot, and learning how to not be killed. Right. So it is right. But for some people, it's still ego stroking. So I, I've got nothing for them. Right. But just make sure you're not in public when you're stroking. Things. Anyway. So. All right. So phase one, potential active threat, that kind of thing. Right. So first things first. Right. If we're not educated, what we, what we have a tendency to do is just look for anything. And this causes a shit ton of stress, okay? Um, when we're doing Rondori training, right? When we go from technique to Rondori training, and again, I, I think I did another Whiteboard Wednesday on this with like five phases and how we have it broken down and how we grow that instead of just throwing people into a ring and telling them to, you know, good luck kind of thing, right? Is... In the beginning, a lot of students tend to like be really, really nervous and all that because they're moving around and they're panicking because they don't know what he's going to throw, right? And so they're watching for anything, right? Any possibility, right? It just, and then they're caught up, right? But the, the more experience we get and the more we know what to look for, we recognize that he can't do anything, right? That from where he is and his setup and all that, he can only do certain things unless he works harder to get right with this other stuff. And again, as my level of, of, um, of proficiency goes up, right. And my knowledge and my knowing what to look for, for cues and clues, but also my ability to position myself to control his actions. And I'm getting closer to fulfilling the lessons on the scrolls, which is to give him less and less options, right? To be in a position where he has three or less options, right? Never leave somebody with one or zero, right? Shit, it's a fan. Um, they'll do crazy, crazy stuff, right? So what I want to do is limit them to three or less. And if I know what I'm doing and I do that, okay, 
not only do I control his options, right? So I'm all I already know what he's going to commit me with, okay? Right? And if he doesn't, I can use that as a gauge to know what his skill proficiency is. Okay, this is important stuff. Okay, unfortunately, and, and one of my teachers, uh, if you've ever seen uh, the book uh, "Wisdom from the Ninja Village of the Cold Moon," right? It was written by uh, Shoshi Hayes a long, long time ago. Uh, one of the lines in there, which is true, right? All of this potential, all the stuff that's in this art, and it's amazing to us how people will stop at the entrance to the path, right? So what most people don't get is, you know, well, like I'm, I'm farther down the path. No, you've packed your bags. You've collected some supplies that you think you're going to need, right? You've got commitment to do it and everything. And then you show up and you start getting some techniques and all that. And then everything else goes away, okay? In this week's uh, Kuden, we're going to be talking about uh, crutches and beliefs and uh, character traits and how if we're not careful... The things that we've put in place to be successful become the very things that stop us from being successful. Anyway, all right, so I'll stop talking about this stuff because I, I see that many people are easily bored because um, we're not doing moves, right? So anyway, we have the three, three phases, right? Uh, he's carrying, but it's not out. It's out and pointed at us, right? Shit's coming at us, okay? So you can, do, you can apply this to any weapon. Any weapon, okay? You can apply this to unarmed, right? But anyway, right? So we're gonna look. We're gonna take a look at when we, when we talk about where somebody's carrying, right? And again, this is a ninety percent rule kind of thing, right? Because people do some weird ass shit, right? Okay. But ninety uh, percent, right? So we're gonna look at this this guy from two different perspectives, right? So I'm gonna use where are my other colors, right? I'm gonna use well, let's do this, right? I'm gonna use two different colors, right? So I'm going to use green for the professional, right? And I'm going to use red for the thug, okay? Can it be a professional thug? Well, technically, if somebody's getting paid for what they do, they're a professional. So, sure, why not? Let's go with that, right? So, anyway, so let's start with the thug first because, in all honesty, he's easier, okay? So, to do the thug, I'm going to have to alter it's clothing a little bit. That's not a cape, okay? That's his hood, okay? Have you ever noticed how some people, this should be a red flag, how some people will wear a hoodie with the hood all the way up and cinched, even in 100-degree weather in the middle of the summer? Interesting, huh? So, so they're only doing it for one of two reasons. It's the style and it's, it's part of a group that I'm associated with, right? Or they're covering shit up, okay? So anyway, right? So we got the hoodie, right? And we got the pockets in the hoodie, okay? So the thug, this is statistically proven. Right. So if you haven't gone through, uh, you know, FBI crime stats and all that kind of stuff. Right. People like me have done that. So trust those people. It doesn't have to be me. You have the survivalist uh, camps and all that kind of stuff. You don't have to go to the camp. Right. It's all on YouTube. Right. So anyway. Right. Ninety percent of the time. OK. Because thug, they come up with a gun somehow. They may buy it in a back alley. They may steal it. They may whatever. Right. Uh, however, they procure it. Right. Their interest is in the weapon and the ammunition. And some, they don't even have ammunition, right? We talk about that in other classes, right? So gun, but they're probably not stealing the holster, right? And if they're wearing sweats or baggy pants or whatever, uh, <laughs> makes it really difficult to get at things, okay? So two places, two primary places that a thug carries a weapon, right? It's either going to be in the hoodie pocket, okay? right or left. I put it over on the right-hand side because all but 7 to 9% of the population is right-handed. So probability says it's over here, okay? But watch for hands and pockets, okay? The other one is if the hoodie doesn't have pockets, right? Or it is, but they hang way down or whatever, 
the other one, put the hoodie down here, right? And that's now his waistline, okay? It's either in the pocket of the hoodie or it's in his waistline, okay? It's tucked in, okay? So it's either in the hoodie pocket or it's tucked in, okay? Somebody's moving around this way and they get their hands in their pockets. Don't worry about the waistline, okay? Chances are it's right there where his hands already are, okay? If he's fidgeting with the material, right? He's messing around and flipping this stuff around, okay? Or doing something weird with the with the, 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 the tail, right? Or the hem of his, of his hoodie, right? Or you don't see bulge. You don't see any kind of telltale sign. Uh, one side's not hanging hanging down a little farther, like there's weight in it or whatever, could be wallet, but right? then chances are it's in the, it's in the waistline, okay? Secondarily for, uh, for a thug, right? So primary is here. It's in one of those two places, okay? 90% of the time. Secondarily, you're going to find it if they pocket, right? And it's a smaller weapon, you're going to find it back here, okay? I should put that that way. All right. It's going to be in the back pocket. Okay. What about an ankle holster? What about a? Have you seriously? He's going to risk messing up his hundred and fifty thousand dollar freaking sneakers, uh, you know, because he's got to look cool uh, because he's going to put a gun. No, it's too far away from the hands. Okay. But remember, there's a 10% leeway kind of thing, right? Okay. So otherwise, right, I'm going to turn this into a windbreaker, right, or a suit or whatever, okay? Leave the hood there. But for the uh, for the professional, for the, for the uh, person who probably has some training behind them or whatever, right, then we have uh, three primary, uh, well, two primary and uh, one backup position, okay? There's a second backup, but it gets lower, right? So primary position, okay? And again, most of these are holstered, right? Holster on the dominant hip, okay? We know that one, right? Okay? Shoulder rig holster on the non-dominant side, okay? And a uh, holster small the back. Right, could be exposed, okay, could be uh, tucked in, right? You have these pancake holsters and things like that. Now, when you see me do this, right, I reach back this way, okay, that's because the way the holsters that I choose um, have the weapon, the the uh, the uh, hand, the hand guard, right, of the of the hand of the pistol pointing that way. A lot of people have it this way, okay. So we have to understand both, right? So for me, I'm hand dominant, right? So my weapon is going to be in this way, right? A lot of people don't like that because it does something to your shoulder to, to be able to grab it this way, right? Uh, for other people, right? For most people, they like it in here, right? So they have to reach for the weapon this way, right? They go between the small, the back, and the weapon to pull it out. My problem with that. My problem with this one is the muzzle passes my body parts on the way out. And if I'm stressing or there's incoming fire or whatever, I can shoot myself. If I do it like this, the muzzle is never pointing at me. Okay? The, the, the hole, right? It's never pointing at me. Okay? So, and on top of that, catch and draw I'm straight out into this. I'm not torquing my arm and then having to unwind the arm, right? Because speed matters. But this isn't a class on, on drawing, okay? And then the other secondary kind of thing is on the dominant side, right? There could be an ankle holster here, or on the non-dominant side, the ankle holster will be on the inside, okay? So think about kneeling and then grabbing at the, um, the non-dominant side, right? So I'm right-handed, so it'll be on my left inner ankle, okay? Because of ease, right? Or it's on the dominant side, right, to put a ankle holster on the inside of the dominant side or outside of the non-dominant side 
right? Uh, makes for more work, right? It's And under pressure, it's not as easy, okay? But what we're looking at is if we know where these things are, then, right, uh, if we have an inkling that this person, you know, might be able to do things, then we can employ uh, a technique or a strategy called Ikichigai. Here's my eraser. Okay? So uh, we get rid of this stuff here, all right? You'll have access later on to the recording as soon as Facebook does its, or not Facebook, as soon as YouTube does its processing. I guess it's Facebook too, because we're over there as well, right? Uh, I need this path going on, okay? So technique, uh, let's write it out with this color, right? Iki Chigai, okay? Iki Chigai means uh, to pass by uh, or passing by, right? There's several of our lineages that have techniques, uh, Tagagi Yoshin kind of thing that has this Iki Chigai, okay? And so uh, what it's designed for is, especially with Tagagi Yoshin, right? Attacks typically aren't done straight on, okay? They're done at a 30 to 45 degree angle to front. They're done from an Iki Chigai uh, kind of standpoint, right? Because you get to a certain point when the average human will drop their guard because you're you're going past, right? You're, you're not confronting them. You didn't step in front of them and, and then start to do things, right? So we get to a certain point where this knife hand or the sword or whatever can come out, come out and catch in this direction, right? It's a very, very odd angle, right? And so it's harder, right? If we're moving in to do this, uh, this commute, right? If you know what that is, right? So he and I are facing, right hand is on lapel, both of us, right? Mine's on his, is on mine. Left hand is on the sleeve, right? So we're in this position, right? Most people do it judo style. And it's okay in the beginning of your training because you're trying to learn the thing that comes from that. But eventually, uh, kumiuch and ikichigai become like really, really important. Really important, okay? Because kumiuch, this position, is a stalemate position, okay? Where we should be testing each other when we first, when me and my partner grab each other, we should be testing each other. I'm trying to to knock him off balance, he's trying to knock me off balance, and I'm able to neutralize and control that. If my positioning or my alignment is off, if things aren't right for me, and I go to push on him, I'm going to break my own back, or uh, at the very least, I'm not going to move him at all. But if he pushes or pulls on me, it's going to break my balance, right? So if that's if that's what's happening, then the initial setup isn't right, because the technique isn't teaching just the this cool move everybody wants to do. It, the, the very first move is how do I break the stalemate condition that's caused by this kumiuch position, right? Uh, same thing with uh, in sword work, right? We have this this uh, uh, kata called um, uh, kirisage, right? Cutting downward, okay? And what it is, 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 is it's those situations where we both went at the same time and we end up crisscrossing right? Locking on. And now we're in this push kind of position because if I let go or I let, you know, if I, if I move the wrong way or whatever, he's going to come and take me, right? So this goes into a, into a situation where primarily I need to not screw up, right? Okay. So whatever. But Kirisage gives you several different ways to break that in a way that you're safe and he gets taken. But if you don't initially establish the mutual resistance kind of thing, where if you screw up, you die kind of thing, then you're not doing Kirisage correctly. It's one thing to learn the mechanical step-by-step -step moves and then walk away going, oh, yeah, I learned another uh, sword defense kata, right? And it's another one to be able to do it correctly so you don't die. Same thing, right? So, uh, but... What we're looking at here is I would be moving in one of two directions, right? If I think that somebody might have one, and I, I had to do this as a police officer, if I think that somebody might be armed, then I want to approach them, right, from an off-angle kind of position because he's going to draw and be used to doing this kind of thing, right? So moving, having to get me on different angles is very, very different, right? So I want to approach, right, in an off-angle Ikichigai uh, position, or initially just kind of walk by like I'm oblivious, okay? So as I'm walking by, and then boom, I can catch him with something, 
or with uh, like the Tagagi Yoshin Ikichigai, I snag his arm, right, and move him this way. Most people stop at the, I snag his arm, I move him back in the opposite direction, and then I, you know, trip him and take him down. But what the hell are you doing? Well, shit, Sensei, I'm snagging his arm, I'm breaking his balance, and I'm throwing him down. Okay, how about if we actually look at tactical uh, application in combat? I am keeping this hand away from his weapon. I don't care if it's sword or gun. And when I control this one, I'm preventing him from turning the weapon to the hand, right? Because if we should be learning this ourselves. If he moves my hand away from the weapon, that this hand can't get to the weapon, then I just move my body to bring the handle of the weapon to the hand so I have another opportunity to get it out. So what Ikichigai does, this basic model from Tagagi Ocean, is it starts to break his balance, but he's going to turn to catch it so he can go, or at the very least, get his hand to the short sword, right? Or he's going to reverse draw so he can he can work with this hand, right? So first move keeps him away from the initial draw impulse, the thing he's trained to do. Next move locks this up and turns the weapon away from him. It keeps it away from his hands. And even if he can cross draw, it keeps it away from me. And then now that he's over here, I'm going to break him and throw him to the ground, right? So it's the same idea. I want to move in so I can either snatch here or I can do that shoot though or whatever I'm doing. I could shove on his, his shoulder in one direction or another kind of thing, right? Keep him off balance so the moral response kicks in and I can keep him from going after that weapon, okay? If he's actively going for it or might already be on it, in the case of the thug with the hands in the in the uh, uh, pockets, right, then we have these uh, techniques where, you know, the person goes to draw and what we do is we step in to jam that draw, right? So in that case, again, from this angle, when he goes for that thing, I want to move in, right? So that's a hand, right? So I can jam up that ability to get at it, okay? And then there's other ones for where he might be and all that. But um, Friday's training is going to pretty much uh, deal with the person, right, being loaded up on the front, okay? So, again, there's a lot more to this. And the defensive action, right, when you initiate. We just did a class on uh, the sends, right? Send means initiate or initiative when you move, okay? And so um, this send, send, no send, right, this highest level, uh, initiation kind of thing is not about when I punch or when he punches or whatever, it's recognizing potential and my initiative when I start my attack happens way back from contact with his body or way back when he actually initiates his punch. So what ends up happening is I end up controlling the bubble, controlling his is a uh, perceptions controlling his uh, his access points and all that kind of stuff long before, right? So we start to see what we're doing as part of the attack or part of our counterattack long before most people realize that an attack has happened, right? And it's a mindset kind of thing. It's just it's just like balance breaking, right? In the Tagagi Ocean with you, balance breaking doesn't stop at breaking balance, right? There's a level above breaking his balance, which is breaking your balance. But it's not like you're breaking your balance this way. It's getting to a point where intuitive response is happening at such a subconscious, unconscious level that you'll end up doing something and your left brain, your consciousness will be surprised. You'll break your own balance. And then you have to keep training with that so that when you surprise yourself, you don't stall, right? You're okay with that kind of thing because shit happens, life happens, okay? So, but either way, right? Again, uh, we're just kind of looking at the bare bones moving in because what we're trying to do is either prevent him from getting at the weapon in that phase one, remember that holstered thing, right? Okay, so even if he has it, and there's this recognition that I have to go first, right? I have to catch him so he's busy fighting gravity or inertia or dizziness or whatever. So we can't get at it this way or we're preventing. And so there's this bridge area in there, right? We're preventing him from getting it full on and out and in my face or pointing at my targets and whatnot. 
because in all honesty, when he's drawing, when he's active in this movement, right, or with the sword or whatever the classical people like, right, when he's between, when he's actively bringing it out, I don't know if he's going to stop with it on me so he can threaten or if he's going to go straight to uh, you know, like Bobi no Kamai, right, the word Bobi. Right. People and even in the dictionary, it's typically translated as defensive. Right. But the kanji that go together to paint the picture for Bobi no Kamai, this thing that kind of looks like a Shoshi no Kamai, except that it's a koto to you thing. Right. The kanji paint the, the, the lesson or what should be going on on the inside. Right. And so the kanji for Bobi means to prepare for an explosion. OK. So when I'm actively operating here, I don't know. If he's going to be attacking me from a from a phase two, level two kind of thing, or if he's going to pull and just start blasting, right? I don't know. So what I'm what I need to start with when it comes to gun defense is uh, is how do I keep him from getting at it, right? To begin with, right? Everybody likes to do the ones where he's got it out, he's pointing at your back, or he's pointing here, or whatever, right? On one level. You should be praying to whatever you believe in and thanking them for him not just blasting and putting a hole in an opportunity for survival. Okay, but if you operate, if your training is all wrapped around your partner walking up and sticking the gun on you so you can do your cool moves and you don't initially do something that when this gun is coming up to clear that line, just in case he fires off one. See the kind of assumptions and shit that goes on in martial arts training, right? The very thing that's supposed to protect us, right? Or we learn a couple of techniques and moves based on pockets of time, certain potentials, certain kind of setups, right? And then we either consciously or unconsciously develop beliefs and I'm going to call them character traits, but they could be training habits or whatever that just operates in a bubble, right? Like the fight starts here. No, the fight started when douchebag woke up this morning and started formulating some thoughts that he was going to go cause some mayhem in the world. And then it escalates more and more, the closer to you, selects you as a target, and then goes into action to do those things. So for the people that say that we're not doing traditional things, uh, I would suggest that they study some more because they have no idea what the hell traditional means, right? Uh, but otherwise, right, all the stuff, right, it's, it's timeless. What's different is that the weapons have changed and therefore the way things can come out into the fight, society has changed, the ground surface you're on, the clothing we're wearing and all those kind of things, right? And if you're not updating this stuff, right, if you think that people trained in gi like we wear in the dojo, back in 13th, 14th century Japan, and not kimono and hakama and things like that, somebody's smoked doobie, or worse, okay? All right, that's all I have for today. Hopefully, you'll you'll sign up and, and be there for the Friday virtual class where we're going to go into this and, and do some models and, and things like that um, and, and deal with some things that we actually have in our pre-black belt training uh, that has to do with, like, catching his intent to go, right? So we can short circuit him before he gets physically too far into it and all that, right? All this stuff that not written in the den show if you're just looking at step by step for kata. Okay. But people could train the way they want, right? I'm only putting this stuff out here based on my experience and based on my lessons with different teachers and actually like surviving shit on the street. Okay. But as one of my teachers said a long time ago, we're all adults. Right. You finally get to do whatever you want. Remember those things you said when you were a kid? When I'm a grown up, I'm going to do whatever I want. Well, now you can. OK, you're a grown up. You can do whatever you want. You can train any way you want. You can act any way you want. You can believe any way you want. Those of us who know would suggest that you don't do a bunch of that bullshit. But no matter what we teach, no matter what you do, no matter what you experience, whatever. Don't forget rule number one. You're a grown up. You can do whatever you want. Okay. And that's where I'm going to leave this. Hopefully I'll see you on Friday. If not, uh, check down. If you're on YouTube, check down in the description section because there's extra information down there. There's some other resources and whatnot. Uh, James may make a worksheet out of this. I don't know. Uh,
Uh, but if he does, there'll be one there that you can click on, go over to the website and uh, grab it, download it. That way you have it to, to box in your stuff. Um, but otherwise, right, uh, if you can, next step would be to actually sign up for camp so you can get a, get a better idea of how to modernize, right, not change anything, just modernize how the art looks in the 21st century. Um, and again, but that's only if you're if you're looking for survival and real world self defense. If you're looking for a martial art because you're looking to learn the moves, earn rank, that kind of stuff, feel all warm and fuzzy about yourself, that's all cool, right? Whatever one people want to do, but that also makes me not your guy, right? Okay? Because I'm always going to be talking about if you screw this up, your family better look good in black, okay? But not the same kind of black that we do, all right? That's it. That's what I have. Uh, I will be checking the comments and stuff later, and I'll, I'll answer everybody that, uh, that ended up commenting. But I'll see you next week on the next episode of Warriors Whiteboard Wednesday. See you guys. Take care. Be safe. Train hard.